Hi, Alan Stankovitz here. This video I'm producing today really kind of has a special meaning. Today is Friday, September 11th, 2020. And on this day of remembrance of the Twin Towers, we've had two monarchs that have hatched uh, out of their chrysalises today. And these are the fourth generation that will be making their way back to Mexico. So it's kind of a special day. This video is rather long, so I've broken it down into individual segments. There are six segments, and if you'd like to, please skip ahead to the parts that you want to actually see. In the first segment, we'll talk about the North American monarch butterfly and why it's so special. In the second segment, we'll talk about the plight of the North American monarch butterfly. In the third segment, we'll talk about the video that I created that is the making of a monarch butterfly and to go through all the phases of the process from egg to caterpillar to chrysalis to eventually the monarch itself. In the fourth segment we'll talk about some recent studies that have been done regarding the captive raising of monarch butterflies. In the fifth segment we'll address the question, the title of this video, Am I Doing Harm? to the North American monarch butterfly. In the sixth and final segment, we'll talk about a few ways that you can help the monarch butterfly. I am not a lepidopterist, nor do I play one on YouTube. I'm just a normal guy who likes to enjoy nature and record what goes on in nature. That's what I do. I have done some research on what you're about to hear via the internet. And we all know that the internet, well, some things could be correct and others may not. So please be sure to do your own research and come to your own conclusions. So I've been a birder for many, many years and study the birds that we see here in the Midwest and upper Midwest. And of course we know that a lot of these species that migrate will come back to the same locations each and every year. I think they even have their favorite feeding grounds that they know and remember. That's amazing when you think about it for the size of a brain that a bird has that it can know exactly where to go each year. Not only that, but they also even know where they can cache food. A lot of jays can memorize all this information of where they've actually stored nuts. So that's really fascinating, right? The monarch butterfly here in North America is a hundred times more fascinating, I think. It is amazing that they can migrate thousands of miles some of these are coming down from Canada and will make it down to central Mexico in the next coming weeks and months. That in itself is amazing, but what's the real kicker is it's not the same butterfly. If we look at the migration path in the spring of the monarch and take it step by step, these monarchs are overwintering down in central Mexico in a diapause state they're just kind of hanging out and waiting for spring in almost a hibernation state. They're not mating, they're just occasionally feeding. And it's amazing to look at how these trees are just dripping with monarch butterflies. But in the early spring, they start their migration to the southern part of the United States looking for milkweed. And they come out of this diapause state and begin mating and laying eggs. Soon after they die, and these eggs hatch and the caterpillars start eating on this milkweed in the south. They do this, they become butterflies, they mate again, they lay eggs, and now we have our second generation that begins their northern trip to the Midwest and eventually in some cases to Canada. So usually around the June-July time frame is when we first start seeing the monarch butterfly up here and it's probably second generation by then. Then they lay eggs, there's caterpillars, become butterflies, and now we have their third generation. 
and some of these that hatched here in our greenhouse this year were third generation. Now some of them make the trip back to Mexico while others will mate again and become a fourth generation. Behind me today we've had two monarch caterpillars that had turned into chrysalises that just hatched today and it's really neat. Uh, these definitely are going to be headed down to Mexico in a few days. I'm probably going to keep them here in the greenhouse just because we're in a cold spell and we're expecting heavy rains tonight. But after these rains, I'll let them out and they will hopefully make the trip down to Mexico. The thing that is just amazing, that blows my mind, is that these butterflies know exactly where to go. This is a really small area in central Mexico that they go to every year and it's not the same monarch. It's not even the second generation or a third sometimes, but more than likely a fourth generation monarch that knows how to get down there to the same spot. How do they do that? Here in our neck of the woods in the Midwest and elsewhere across the United States and down to Mexico, there's been a decrease in the overall number of North American monarch butterflies. I believe that there is a number of different things that are going on in unison that are causing their numbers to drop. But it's not just even the monarch butterflies. It's a lot of the pollinators, a lot of the insects. I was driving down the road the other day and I said to Joe, I said, do you notice anything different? She goes, no. I said, do you notice anything different about the windshield? No. I said, does it look cleaner than it normally does? And the reason why I asked that is because I remember back as a kid living in Chicago and we'd go visit our great aunt in Cascade, Iowa and our car would be just plastered with insects. <laughs> And it's kind of sad and gross and all that stuff, I guess, but it showed how much of an insect population there was. Here in southeast Minnesota, when I go driving down the road, I'd be lucky if I get a few splotches on the windshield anymore. Where are all the insects? Where are all the pollinators? Our yard is set up for pollinators. We have flowers galore, and we do have some honeybees that probably belong to a beekeeper somewhere in the area. And we also have other bees that are native, and we've got wasps, and we've got, a, you know, bumblebees, and a few, very few, butterflies. But the numbers are way, way, way down. Now, I suspect that the reason for this is probably climate change, and how the weather has been so weird, and that in itself is affecting populations of insects. But I'm sure it's not just that. We have a lot of issues going on right now with certain pesticides and herbicides that are being used that are supposedly helping out crops and flowers and so forth, but are directly harming insects. And I fear that a lot of that is really the main culprit as to why the numbers are down. There's a number of websites that talk about this on the internet. I'll list a few below but it's something that's uh, really sad. When I built the greenhouse, I built it for a couple of reasons. I built it for not only starting seeds in the spring, but I wanted to help the pollinators. So we'll talk more about that in the sixth segment where I talk about things you can do to help the plight of the monarch butterfly. For those of you that haven't seen it yet, I have a three minute video that shows the whole process of the making of a monarch butterfly from egg to caterpillar to chrysalis to eventually the butterfly itself. The whole process is incredibly amazing. The adult monarch butterfly in the wild lays about 300 to 500 eggs. And some of these eggs are fertile, some of them aren't, and the ones that are make it into a tiny, tiny, tiny caterpillar. And I have in that video, I show you my finger being put up against the size of the caterpillar to kind of give a perspective as to how tiny these first caterpillars are. They actually molt five times during the process and eat a lot of milkweed. 
and they eat milkweed because it is poisonous to predators and so that's why they love milkweed and that's actually the only plant that they will feast on is milkweed so once these caterpillars become full grown they kind of stop eating and for the next day or so they're looking for a place to morph into a chrysalis and here in the greenhouse I've found them on flower pots on the side of a table on a stock tank and occasionally plants too uh, carrots celery that I have growing in here and even on the milkweed itself so when they're about to morph into a chrysalis they will attach themselves to the underside of an object and go into this J-shaped formation. And when you see that, you know you're getting close to the time that they're going to morph into a chrysalis. And originally when I started recording video, I thought, well, I'll do a time lapse because I've seen other time lapses on YouTube of the whole process. What I didn't realize is that once they start the process, it happens rather quickly. And over a half hour's time, it's pretty much morphed itself completely into a chrysalis. So I decided to actually run long videos and speed them up a bit instead of trying to do a time lapse so I wouldn't miss anything because the whole process of turning into a chrysalis happens rapidly. And once they're in that chrysalis form, you will see these little gold specks on the side of the chrysalis. No one seems to know exactly why they exist, but they aren't gold. They're actually made from carotene inside of the milkweed plant. You know, these caterpillars are mainly made out of milkweed. <laughs> so when the caterpillar morphs into a chrysalis, it's kind of like it's dissolved. It's rather bizarre, but there are some specialized cells that start building the monarch inside of the chrysalis. The caterpillar no longer exists. The cells are there, at least some of them. Some of them just make it into other parts of the butterfly. And so this whole process of making the butterfly inside of this chrysalis takes about six to eight days before they hatch. Now here in the greenhouse this week, We've had a cold spell with a lot of rain every day and I've purposely left a few windows open to keep the temperature down because I didn't want them to be hatching in fall weather. When they hatch out of that chrysalis, you never know exactly when it's going to happen, but when it happens, it happens fast. Within a matter of a half hour, they're totally out of the chrysalis and they're drying their wings. Actually, when they first emerge from the chrysalis, their abdomen is really huge and it's full of liquid and that liquid gets pumped into the wings. So it takes a matter of hours for them to fully become a more normal looking butterfly and begin to beat their wings and eventually fly off. In 2018, some graduate students from the University of Chicago were conducting research on monarch butterflies and had some commercially raised monarch butterflies and they were putting them into flight simulators to see if they had directional cues and knew the southward direction because obviously if they're going to migrate in the fall they need to know direction and typically the monarch butterflies use cues from daylight uh, UV light to determine exactly where the Sun is in the sky they also use time to determine which direction to fly in. But these commercially raised monarch butterflies were confused. They were flying in all directions and not necessarily south. So they started doing some more studies into why this was occurring and they came to a conclusion that it wasn't just the commercially raised monarch butterflies that were having trouble. They found that even some wild monarch butterflies that had been raised indoors we're having similar issues. Now, this problem does not exist with all of them, but with a good majority of them. They do know for a fact that some commercially raised monarch butterflies that were tagged made their way down to central Mexico. But in a nutshell, this was a problem where they were seeing, you know, definite numbers, large numbers that 
were confused and could not find South. So in 2019, I read this study and I started wondering about our greenhouse because I had just started raising milkweed last year and we've had a few that have hatched out this year and could they find their way? I wrote to the uh, department that's been doing the study and I asked what they thought about raising them in a greenhouse and they said well we don't have any evidence one way or the other but they would assume that they would probably be able to find their way. Lo and behold here we are in 2020 and a new study has been released and in this study guess what they found that even monarchs raised in a greenhouse were having trouble finding south. This is rather discouraging news for me and I wonder now if our greenhouse is having an adverse effect on these wild monarchs that are allowed to come in on their own, I'm not raising them, and lay eggs and become a butterfly. Are they having issues? We're going to talk about that in the next segment. So I first of all want to thank the team at the University of Chicago for doing this research. But I do feel that other research needs to be conducted, and I'm sure they probably agree with that too. It would be interesting to find other studies regarding greenhouses or enclosures to see if they come up with the same conclusion about the problems that these monarchs seem to be having with uh, directional cues. One thing I, w I wonder about in these studies is they're using this flight simulator, which definitely shows that there is an issue. But what if you were to release these butterflies? Would they eventually, over a day or two, figure it out and fly south anyways? I had read somewhere about a group of monarch butterflies that were released in the southeast United States that figured out how to get down to Mexico. So maybe there's some truth to that, that after a while they may figure things out and get to their destination anyways. But there's a lot of mystery here and a lot of variables and things that need to be addressed. This greenhouse is uh, 20 by 14 and I built it from scratch and I could have done a kit, but the problem I had with kits are is that in most cases their sides are enclosed. They use polycarbonate panels and they encompass the entire greenhouse from wall to ceiling. And I started thinking about this, and one of my goals with this greenhouse wasn't had nothing to do with monarch butterflies, but it had to do with pollinators. I wanted to make sure that the pollinators had the ability to go freely in and out of our greenhouse, because besides planting seeds in the spring, I wanted to actually grow some food and some flowers inside of the greenhouse. And I wanted to make sure that the pollinators were able to get in and out of the greenhouse. So this design is my own design. I used clear glass windows. These are non-UV protected windows. They have no filtering whatsoever. Um, they open their sliders so that in the summer all the windows are open and the doors are open during the day, which allows a lot of insect population to move in and out of the greenhouse freely, including butterflies. I start to wonder if that might be an issue with some of these greenhouses if they have any kind of UV filtration. Now the ceiling to our greenhouse is uh, made out of polycarbonate panels and they are UV filtering. There could be an issue with this greenhouse if they are looking straight up, I guess, or sensing daylight straight up because the UV light is being filtered out and monarch butterflies use UV light to sense direction. I'm really curious about this study that they did because I wonder if there could be something else at play here besides just cues from UV light. Because there are studies that say that monarch butterflies also take cues from magnetic north. And if you had a greenhouse that was a metal frame and could potentially even have metal in the glass because a lot of these older greenhouses would use something like chicken wire so that if the glass broke it wouldn't shatter on people. So if you had a metal frame and you had metal in the glass and you had a concrete floor with rebar in it, which is iron, 
you've now built yourself a Faraday cage. And you're shielding a lot of the uh, sense of magnetic north from these butterflies. So that would be something to be looked into, I think, is to check to see also the environment for this particular greenhouse that they did these tests in. Something to think about anyways. In our particular case, um, we don't have any metal in the structure of the frame. We do have some uh, stock tanks uh, near the ground. We have a gravel floor. We do not have concrete. So there is a little bit of metal within this greenhouse, but it's not something like a Faraday cage. An interesting observation with the monarch butterflies that we see on our property here is that they're not only laying eggs inside of our greenhouse, they're also laying eggs on milkweed that we have in our garden. Beyond our garden, we also have over seven acres of prairie, which also includes milkweed. And then we also have milkweed that's growing on our property wild. Interestingly, I'm not seeing caterpillars making it to their final stages. Usually there's something that's feeding on these monarchs. Even though they're poisonous, it's been known that certain bird species will actually consume caterpillars and monarch caterpillars as well. And Baltimore Orioles are one of those species and we have a lot of Baltimore Orioles here uh, during the summer months. And I'd see these caterpillars uh, outside of the greenhouse here and they might last three or four or five days and they might make it to the second or third molting, but then they disappear. And looking at all the plants around here, uh, Joe and I have only found one chrysalis that uh, hatched in our garden area. Whereas inside of our greenhouse, we've had well over 20 chrysalises that have hatched into beautiful butterflies. Are we doing them harm or not? Again, I don't know. I don't know if anyone for sure knows the answer, but their chances of survival in our greenhouse are much, much, much greater. And they seem to be knowing which way to go. Out of all the monarchs that have hatched and that we've watched in this greenhouse that have flown away with the windows open on all sides and the doors open, all but two have gone out through the south windows. And the two that didn't go out through the south windows, one was held here captive overnight because we have a hummingbird in here. One was held was held captive overnight because of storms. I had closed all the windows. And it was on the north window the next morning. So that one flew the other way with the windows closed. Don't know. And then we had one that flew up and I had to rescue from the, uh, the inside ceiling of the greenhouse. Other than that, all of them went out through one of the south windows. So if you'd like to comment, please do so below. I'd really like to get people's opinions about whether we're harming monarch butterflies by allowing them to breed within our greenhouse. Well, the obvious thing that you can do to help the monarch butterfly, if you have a piece of property and you have some land, is to plant milkweed. You know, this is their natural food source and where they actually lay their eggs. They will not lay their eggs on anything but milkweed. So we need more milkweed plants. And then, of course, you want to make sure that besides the milkweed, you give them pl plenty of food. So be sure to have all sorts of flowers in your garden. That's something that we've been doing here, and it's amazing to watch. We don't have too many butterflies, unfortunately, but when we do, it's really enjoyable to watch them feeding on bee balm and other plants in our garden. But besides the obvious, there are other things you can do. And even if you live in an urban area and you have no access to grow uh, any kind of milkweed or flowering plants, there's still something you can do. There's a lot going on right now in the science-based area of agriculture. Some of this is by the big seed companies such as Monsanto and even nurseries. To give you an example, about two years ago it was in the spring that we went to a local nursery and bought some plants. They were beautiful, perfect, perfect plants. And they were flowers and we had them hanging in uh, flowering baskets around our front yard. But I started noticing within a few days that I was finding a lot of dead bumblebees around. 
and I wrote to the University of Minnesota about this and asked if they thought if it could be anything to do with my plants or was it a natural die-off and they never would say for sure but the question I did ask them was their thoughts on neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids are commonly found nowadays in a lot of nursery plants. So when you go to your local nursery in the spring and pick up your flowering baskets, a lot of times these plants are laced with neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids are in an insecticide that actually is infused inside of the plant itself. And any insects that feed on the plant die. And I was like amazed to find this out that a lot of these nursery plants have neonicotinoids. So the thing you could do is in the spring when you're out shopping for flowers is to ask the nursery do these plants have neonicotinoids uh, within the plant? Because if they do I would not buy them. I, as a matter of fact that was actually one of the reasons why I decided to build this greenhouse was to grow our own flowers because I just wanted nothing to do with the commercial nursery business when it comes to this stuff. Now, this is not across the whole industry. There are a lot of nurseries that do the right thing and do not use neonicotinoids. But you should ask that question before you buy any of your plants to find out if in fact they could be harmful to the insects in your garden. So across North America, we've got all this agriculture here in the Midwest, it's all corn and soybeans. But the majority of these farmers now are using genetically modified seed. And the reason for it has to do a lot with money and being able to get greater yields out of your acres without damaging the plants when you're using herbicides and pesticides. These genetically modified seeds have been modified so that they resist things like Roundup. So this allows the farmers to just spray Roundup throughout their entire field and it doesn't affect the plant but it kills off everything else including plants that are beneficial including milkweed. So the way that we can prevent this from happening is to, to check out our food source and to find out if the food that we're eating has anywhere in the chain a genetically modified seed because if that is the case and if we stop doing that it would force this process to end we can thank Monsanto for this by the way as well as other large conglomerates they're basically killing off everything that exists out there other than their plants this is ridiculous I, I mean it's crazy yeah I get it that wow look at this I've got a field that's got you know the best bushels per acre ever but at what cost are you doing that and I get it farmers have a really rough time making ends meet they're constantly being besieged by large corporations that want the lowest dollar possible for their product. Thank Walmart for that one, as well as others. So I get the plight of the farmer. I really feel for them. But I think we need to take a step back and look at what we're doing that's causing these problems. Because there is a problem out there for sure. And I think if everyone was just to look at their windshield and look at the lack of insects, going down a country road, they'd realize that something's not right. And yeah, it's bad when you've got infestations of insects and they cause all sorts of damage. But at what cost are we doing this? And we're messing with nature. Is this something that we really should be doing? I'll get off my soapbox now. Thanks for watching. And if you have any comments, please leave them below. And we'll catch you in the next episode.